Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. And on the line with us is Judd Legum, the journalist and founder of Popular.info, a newsletter that I subscribe to and have for quite some time. Encourage you to as well. Uh, his Twitter handle, Judd Legum, J-U-D-D-L-E-G-U-M. And uh, Judd, you, you had a recent piece about the, uh, the Joe Manchin industry, essentially. Um, uh, tell us about this. Yeah, well, what I did, Tom, was uh, I took a look at um, Joe Manchin's former staffers and what they're doing. And the reason why this is so important is that, in, in addition to everything else that you hear a lot about Joe Manchin in the news, he, as the chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, is going to be responsible for shaping the climate provisions in the reconciliation package that's currently before Congress. And yet he now, we don't started know like six or eight fossil fuel companies or something. Isn't this sort of like putting the does. fox in charge of the chicken committee? It, 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 it is. I mean, he, he did start, I believe, three coal companies. A couple of them have been merged together. Mm -hmm. um, they're now run by his son. He maintains uh, an ownership interest and receives dividends from those um, from those companies, so he obviously he has an interest in in the continued use of coal, and you know you you you, you have to understand that he is from West Virginia, so probably any senator from West Virginia is going to have some allegiance uh, to coal. But um, this is this is a personal financial interest as well as well. But going back to the um, going back to the staffers, you know, took a look at three of his chiefs of staff, uh, communications director. Uh, other uh, top former staffers, and many of them have now become lobbyists. They are lobbying on behalf of the fossil fuel industry, and they're very open about the fact that they remain in contact uh, with Joe Manchin. And in fact, uh, one of the people that I uh, profiled, uh, Jonathan Knott, who was Manchin's communications director, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, Manchin was quoted uh, in his in his in the announcement announcing that he was going to this um, firm and saying how excited he is that uh, his former staffer is now going to be a lobbyist. Uh, about a month after that press release was out, um, he that staffer Jonathan Cott uh, signed uh, was added to a contract with the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. So, uh, you know, you can see how uh, uh, essentially these staffers are, are trading their connections with Manchin uh, for fairly lucrative positions in the lobbying industry and then are now going to use um, those connections to, to shape what, what potentially could be the most significant climate legislation that uh, we'll have the opportunity uh, to see in some time. So to just kind of restate the web here, essentially, while Joe Manchin himself has started a couple of coal companies, his son runs them, he still makes a half million bucks a year in dividends, um, you know, and his state, of course, is big on coal and natural gas. Um, while he himself is the chairman of the committee in the Senate that is going to write the climate legislation, uh, is th this is for the big reconciliation bill, right? That's right. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, a central component of it. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on with taxes and health care and everything else, but climate's a part of it. Right, right. So he's going to be doing that. But beyond that, there's a bunch of people who used to work on his staff who are deeply embedded in the fossil fuel industry now as lobbyists. And they're not lobbying Joe Manchin. They're lobbying Steve Danes and John Tester and John, I mean, not to, I'm just picking random names here, but, you know, the, the so-called moderates of the Senate, presumably, as well as all the Republicans, um, to go along with fossil fuel programs that will continue the profits of the industry, presumably? Yeah, and I think, I think also just leveraging their connections with Joe Manchin to give the fossil fuel industry an insight into his thinking, what's at play, what's not at play, that's just not available uh, mm. to the general public. So it essentially, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are at issue here, um, the the tax subsidies that the fossil fuel companies get, but also 
um, you know, the the proposed uh, transition from you know coal and other polluting sources to clean energy sources. And the open question is, you know, how aggressive will that be? Um, and you know, you do have a, a effectively a web of conflicts that's tilting the playing field uh, toward the fossil fuel industry at this uh, very critical time. So what do we do with this information, Judd? Well, I guess you, you could crawl under your blanket and, uh, and, uh, and wait for it. Wait for Not an day. option. Um, no, but I think it's important that people, people understand it uh, because the more um, scrutiny that's on uh, Joe Manchin and and really the whole you know the the ent- all the Democrats in the Senate because it's not just Manchin there's also um, a number of other senators who are, who are raising questions and and seeking to pare back um, this bill the more scrutiny that they're under um, the less free they they'll feel to do you know the bidding of the of the industry um, and, and I think that's what's um, yeah I think that's I think that is important yeah yeah. Um, do, do you see do you see any possibility that this actually let me put this in a larger frame you know typically you know in the old LBJ era um, when he was putting together the legislation he'd say okay we got this core thing that we want to do uh, you know we, we want to pass the Great Society we want to have Medicare as a part of it um, but he's got some senator who's not all that excited about Medicare so we'd go to him and say what do you want and that senator would say oh I want a new bridge in my in my, uh, you know, in my uh, uh, town with my name on it. Okay, fine, we can give you that. And so basically what they would do is they would put together, you know, large legislation pieces that had, you know, what you might call pork in it, um, but it was like gifts to various people. It seems like this process right now for this reconciliation package is, as a consequence of how politics have changed, particularly since Citizens United as a result of the Supreme Court, is moving in the opposite direction. And that is to say, we have a whole bunch of pieces of legislation that are being thrown together into this bill, all of which have constituencies, but all of which have clear enemies. And it's like, you know, okay, we're going to lower drug prices. Well, that's going to bring out the pharma, you know, the, 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 the largest, most aggressive, well-paid uh, lobbying group in, in Washington, D.C., I believe. Uh, we're going to do something about climate change. That brings out the fossil fuel industries. Um, you know, we're going to do something about low-income housing. That brings out Jared Kushner and all the slumlords. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know how to change that dynamic. Do you think that that's an accurate description of how things have changed in the last 50 years f- from the way lobbying and, and legislation being made uh, has, used to be versus how it is now? And that might be why, in large part, for the last 20 years, we really haven't seen any substantial legislation that benefits the people, just big things that benefit corporations. I do think that that's largely accurate. And I think the problem is, is that there are a number of problems with the status quo. Um, you know, whether it's drug prices, whether it's, you know, the, the power of the fossil fuel industry. And there's a lot of, but there's a lot of people who are benefiting, you know, quite, quite richly from the status quo, and they're going to fight tooth and nail. Um, to prevent any kind of change. I do still think that there is an opportunity. It doesn't seem like this whole package is going to stick together, but ultimately, you know, Democrats are in control of, of the House, the Senate, and the White House. And, you know, Biden has a, has a role. Um, the Senate leadership has a role. The House leadership has a role. They can, they can set priorities um, and insist Things, you know, ultimately, you know, Manchin gets to shape this bill as the chairman of the um, of the Energy Committee. But we saw, you know, they stripped out those um, those uh, drug pricing provisions mm-hmm. really at the at the behest of the industry. But Nancy Pelosi put them back in, you know, for when when right. when they advanced the bill to the floor. So I think there are ways for for the lead, for leadership to stand up and really insist on what's important. And I, 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 I anticipate that these climate provisions will be part of that. Right. It's, it's like we're down to the point where that one constituency that should be the most important, what the people want, uh, you know, it's been 20, 30 years since that has been seriously considered. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going back toward that. But boy, is the resistance serious. Judd Legum. 
Uh, Popular.info is the newsletter. Check it out and subscribe. It's free. You can sign up right now. Judd, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Tom.